you know, it's, it's nothing I haven't done before, you know, from, from high school to college, you know, just being a smaller guy, kind of having to prove yourself uh, and to this day, it's the same thing. So, uh, you know, people ask me, do you feel disrespect? I'm like, no, um, you know, it's kind of just been my life and it's kind of a place I feel comfortable in. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to have my friend Taylor with me today. I um, I have going on behind me the Colorado Avalanche Championship Parade. And so there's all this noise and there's sirens going on and stuff. And I, I thought I'd give people a sense of the view going on right behind me outside my window. But there's everyone in the streets of Colorado with the team going by. And they've even got the They've even got the Budweiser Clydesdales out here for the for the championship parade. Um, Taylor, I'm, I'm hopeful someday that's got you in it for winning the Super Bowl with one of the teams you play for. Um, let me um, let me dump into a quick introduction of you and a little bit on your background, and then you and I can dive into our conversation, Taylor. So Taylor Heineke is quarterback of the Washington Commanders of the National Football League. He played college football at Old Dominion University and was signed by the Minnesota Vikings as an undrafted free agent after the 2015 NFL Draft. Heineke has also been a member of the New England Patriots, Houston Texans, and Carolina Panthers, as well as the St. Louis Battle Hawks of the XFL. After an admirable performance filling in for the injured Alex Smith in the 2020 NFL playoffs, Heineke earned a second contract with the Washington football team in 2021. He was named starter following an injury to first-string quarterback Ryan Fitzpatrick during the team's opener last season. So, Taylor, let's, let's back up here. You grew up in Lawrenceville, Georgia, which is between Atlanta and Athens, and you had a stellar high school career as a screaming eagle at Collins High School, uh, being named Old Spice National Player of the Year and being MVP of the North-South All-Star Game. How'd you end up at ODU and not at the University of Georgia or Georgia Tech? Yeah, so, you know, growing up throughout high school, I didn't get to start until my junior year. Um and at that point, we had probably the best running back in the in the state at that time. So we were handing the ball off 40 times a game. I maybe got to throw the ball, you know, seven to 12 times. So I didn't have a lot of great film out there. I was, I was a shorter guy. I think I was maybe 5'9", five, 5'10", five, 170 pounds. Um, so my biggest thing was going to all these different summer camps, all these colleges, trying to just get a coach to like me. And um you know, sure enough, senior year, um, we, we turned the spread. So I was throwing the ball 30 to 40 times a game and started putting up some good numbers. And we started winning some games. And uh, late my senior year, I, I got my first offer from Old Dominion. And, uh, you know, I took it um, right when it came. I took it and I just, you know, they, they took a chance on me and um, it was my first offer. And uh, it meant a lot to me. So I just committed right there on the spot. That says a lot about you, Taylor. And I think having studied your career a little bit as it relates to a, you know, they committed to you, you committed to them. And then sort of this stick with itness that has existed in your personality. Where'd that, where'd that tenacity or stick with itness come from? Who, who, who do you think you learned that from? I think I learned it from my parents. Um, you know, growing up, I always had this battle between football and baseball, which one I liked more. And I just remember during the baseball season, um, I would love it. And I would be like, I don't want to play football. And my dad would be like, no, just, you know, give it two weeks. Uh, and if you start it, you got to finish it. So like once I started a sport, um, he made me finish the whole season. And I always remember I always hated it at first. And by the end of it, I loved it. So um, that, I think that's kind of where I, I learned it. Um, you know, once you start something, you finish it. And I've kind of kept that with me throughout my whole life. What about if you will, I mean, you did so well in being in the North South game and being the MVP of that. Um, anything there as it relates to sort of a chip on your shoulder as far as not being recruited by one of the big SEC schools? Yeah, uh, I remember going down there to South Georgia to kind of practice and get ready for the game. And everyone was not giving us the North a chance because, you know, South Georgia was huge for football. Lots of, you know, Georgia commits, Alabama commits, you know, the whole spiel. So, um, you know, I have been like the small, probably the smallest guy out there on the field. Um, you know, a lot of us up there from the North team, we had a chip on our shoulder. We just kind of wanted to show the South, you know, what we could do. And uh, we went out there and balled out. We beat them. And uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to win the MVP. So that was that was a pretty cool day. 
So you headed off to ODU where you went 10 and three, 11 and two, eight and four and six and six over your four years there. You won the Walter Payton Award and the Dudley Award both in 2012. So you you sort of, you know, you made a big splash at ODU sort of right out of the gates when you got there as, as, a, as a freshman. And um, talk about talk about the difference between playing high school ball and going to college ball and, and the immediate success you had at the college level. Yeah, so I think the difference, I think, and it goes from high school to college, the NFL, it's, it's kind of the same. So every time you move up a level, um, the guys are a little bigger, a little stronger, a little faster, and a little smarter. Um, and you just have to be more consistent every time you go up a level. So, uh, again, going from high school to, to Old Dominion, we were the FCS at the first two years. So that's, you know, the championship uh, division, you know, with North Dakota State and guys like that. And then my junior year, we moved up to FBS. So we were playing a Conference USA schedule, a little better competition. And uh, again, so every level you go up, the guys are getting a little better, a little faster. So um, I just learned that, you know, when you keep going up those levels, you have to be more consistent. You have to be good all the time, not just some of the time. So your sophomore year, you're playing UNH. I think you all went down 24 nothing in the first in the first quarter. Um, tell us about the comeback and tell us about your performance in the comeback. Yeah. So uh, we were down 24, nothing, I think within five, six minutes in the first quarter. And I remember our offensive coordinator, coach, uh, coach Scott um, comes up to me on the sideline. He's like, Hey, we're going to throw the ball every play the rest of the game. And I was like, okay, he's joking, you know, whatever. Um, 79 passes later, um, you know, it's the fourth quarter and we're winning 64 to 61. And uh I went out there and threw for 730 yards, uh, five touchdowns, ran for 60 yards and a touchdown. Um, yeah, we came back and won. So it was it was a bizarre game. It was our first division game, um, conference game. And uh, it, it was a lot of fun. I remember that for the rest of my life, for sure. So when you went to the pro level, you've had a number of injuries. Were you ever injured during your collegiate career? You know, I, I never missed any games, um, but... I think I had a concussion, which, you know, lined up perfectly because the next week we had a bye week. Um, and then my senior year, I got banged up where the guy hit me pretty good and I chipped my clavicle and had an AC joint separation and kind of played with that for the rest of the year. Um, but, you know, it was one of those deals where I didn't know if I was ever going to play again after after college. So I just wanted to kind of grind through it. But, uh, yeah, in college, I didn't really sustain any major ones. But when you get to the NFL, those guys are a lot bigger. So, um yeah, it's different. So, so let's turn to that. You're undrafted out of ODU and you walk on to the Vikings. Talk, talk about that process. I mean, the, the, the playing in the NFL is plenty of co plenty college football players dream, but only a certain number are drafted and then a certain even less actually walk on and say, OK, great. I didn't get drafted. Now I'm going to make the effort to go walk on. What was it that got you to say they've missed the opportunity and I'm going to go show them? Yeah, so um, I kind of rewind a little bit. I'll go back to my pro day. Um, there was only one coach there, and it was Coach Scott Turner at Minnesota. He was a quarterback coach at the time. And, I mean, there was a bunch of different other scouts, but he was the only coach. And he was showing an interest from the beginning. And, you know, draft day was going on. Uh, third day was going, which was I expected to be on that day. And if I wasn't drafted, um, you know, there's going to be some opportunities to kind of go try out for different teams. And Minnesota called and they said, hey, we're not going to draft you, but we want you to come up. And I felt the most comfortable with them because, you know, Scott was there and he showed some interest. So went up there, um, had a great, you know, rookie preseason. And uh, fortunately, they, they kept me on the team. And from then on, you know, every year it's kind of been clawing your way in and, you know, it's, it's nothing I haven't done before, you know, from from high school to college, you know, just being a smaller guy, kind of having to prove yourself. Uh, and to this day, it's the same thing. So, uh, you know, people ask me, do you feel disrespectful? I'm like, no, um, you know, it's kind of just been my life and it's kind of a place I feel comfortable in. So you go from the Vikings to the Patriots for a very brief period. Um, by the way, did you meet Brady when you went onto the Patriots practice squad because there's there's an end to this about going down to Tampa Bay and playing against him. But I, I, we're going to get to that. But I, I just want to know when you went to Tampa Bay, when you went to the Patriots for that short period, did you did you end up meeting Tom and playing against Tom or not? Yeah. So I was there for three weeks. And I remember the first day I was there, I was like, OK, I'm going to try and 
have a good first impression. I'm going to get there. I'm going to be the first one in the building. So I, I remember walking in the building at 5.30 or 5.45. I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely the first one in here. And I go right to the quarterback meeting room, and he's already in there with a coffee in hand, feet up, watching film. And I'm like, man, this guy must have got here at, you know, 5 if he's already doing this. Yeah. Um, so that was a really cool experience. So I got to kind of pick his brain and be around him, Coach Belichick, for about – three weeks, which is a really cool experience. So um, you then go from the Patriots to the Texans where you get your NFL debut Christmas day, 2017 against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Describe for us, Taylor, what's that's like, you, you know, what's it like walking out to go under center in the NFL? Yeah. So again, I'll kind of rewind here a little bit. Patriots cut me after three weeks. I was at home for about six or seven weeks that maybe it might be over. And Houston calls. They put me on the practice squad. Um, the starting quarterback gets injured a couple weeks. So then they kind of move me up to be the backup. Well, we're playing on Christmas Day. TJ Yates gets hurt in the first half and they throw me in there. So I go from never think I'm going to play to playing on Christmas day in my NFL debut very quickly. National television, national, national television. National television. Yep. Against the Steelers. who was a you know very good team at the time. And um, so it was crazy. I got my but, first. Well, I mean, literally like help us get inside your body as they say you're in and you're walking out on that field. I mean, are you, does everything get blacked out because you're so focused on the moment or do you kind of look around and say, OMG, I can't believe I'm actually walking out onto a field on national television. Kind of both. Uh, first thing that goes through your mind is like, all right, we're doing this. This is uh, this is happening. Um, kind of that oh my god moment. But when you're walking out in the field and you get in that huddle and those guys are looking at you, um, you know you're prepared for that moment. You you've you've worked hard and you know this is the moment you've dreamed of. So in, at, at that moment, you kind of black out and start focusing in and kind of doing what you've been doing for the last. You know, I've been playing football since I was eight years old. So however many years that was at that point. Um, I was just, you know what, you know how to play ball, just go out there and do it. So you completed a pass, and then you got hit really hard and got a concussion. And <laughs> so he, you're out, and then you moved from the Texans to the Panthers, and you're backing up Cam Newton. He gets injured, and you got your first start. And in that first start, you went 33 for 53, 274 yards, a touchdown, but three interceptions. Talk through that first start, because unlike I would imagine getting, if you will, pulled off the sidelines and said, you're out there and you don't really have the the nerves going because you didn't think that you were going to get called into the game backing up. But now all of a sudden it's your first start. So talk through that one where all the pressure has come in of you're starting the next day and you got to be ready to go. Yeah. So that whole week um, I knew I was going to be starting. They kind of shut Cam down. We were out of the playoff race. Um, I know Cam's shoulder was was pretty messed up at that point. Um, so they kind of made the move to have me start. So I got the whole week of preparation of, of reps with all the guys. Um, and then that Sunday, that was my first NFL start against the hometown Atlanta Falcons, where I'm from. So it was, it was pretty cool. I had a bunch of friends and family come up. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the first drive we had was about 18 plays. I think it was like 10 minutes. We went down, scored a touchdown, and it was like, wow, this is going to be a great game. Well, right before halftime, I get hit, and I try to brace my fall, and I tear my tricep. And, um, you know, again, I didn't know if I was ever going to play again. Um, so I was like, you know, let's put a brace on this thing. I'm going back out there. I want to play. So I go out back out there, and again, so three picks. They didn't have a great game, um, but it was a lot of fun. And, you know, you learn a lot from that, from your first start, I think to your second start, you get, that's like a, that's a huge kind of learning experience. You kind of understand what you did wrong, what you did right, what you need, what needs to happen throughout the game for you to have a chance to win. Um, so I didn't get that second, that second start until you know the playoffs here against Tampa. Right. So then you go to the XFL for a period of time and XFL basically got wiped out by COVID. And so you, you didn't actually play in the XFL. And then remind me, Taylor, of when it was that you were sleeping on your sister's couch and trying to figure out whether you wanted to keep going or whether you were going to give up on the dream of football. Was it at this time or had it been previously that you were just on your sister's couch with your brother-in-law and hanging out and trying to figure out, am I going to stick with this dream or am I giving this thing up? Yeah, so the XFL kind of, you know, like you just said, the COVID happened, XFL kind of folded, and um, I didn't know what to do. I, the first thing I did was call Scott Turner um, and ask him if there was any coaching, you know, 
coaching like available options that I can maybe coach for him. Um, he said, well, first off, you got to finish school. And I said, okay. So my plan was to go down and, and live with my sister and take classes, online classes, and um, just try and, and try and get that degree and go, go into coaching. And during that time period, I was still training just for the small possibility that I might still get a call. And so, yeah, I was, you know, sleeping on my sister's couch in her guest bedroom, um, taking classes, training. And my brother-in-law would would push me like, you know, there's days where I would feel kind of sorry for myself or I would just not want to work out and do this and do that. He's like, nope, 730 in the morning, you're putting this 50 pound vest on. We're going for a six to seven, seven mile walk. I'm like, okay. And he would push me every day. And um, I don't, I think if it wasn't for him, uh, I wouldn't have been ready when I, my, my name was called. So um, yeah, I'm sitting at home. It's, it's uh, right after Thanksgiving and I'm yeah, studying December, some- December of D- December of 2020, right? Yeah, December. You like December. Your first start was in December. You get called up by the Redskins in December. Your birthday's in March, but December's got to be a special month for you. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm laying in bed, um, studying for my finals, and I get a call from my agent saying, "You ready to play some football?" I was like, "Where am I going?" He said, "Washington D.C." And uh, it was cool because Scott Turner was there, uh, Coach Ron Rivera was there. I've had some, you know, familiarity with them through the past. And again, the only reason they brought me up was, I don't know if you remember, but do you remember when the Denver Broncos had all their quarterbacks get COVID and they had a receiver play quarterback? Oh yeah. Right. So that's the only reason they brought me up was because, Hey, this might happen to us. This guy knows the offense already. We'll bring him up just for emergencies. And a couple of things happen here and there. Um, a couple of guys get injured and next thing you know, they're throwing me in the game and playoff game against Tom Brady. So, all right. So I've heard that you didn't know you were going to go into that game until the day before that Rivera spoke to you 24 hours before the playoff game. Is that right? Yes. So I was practicing all week like I was going to start. But, you know, Alex Smith was kind of just he was kind of banged up. He was getting some treatment, trying to get him back ready for the game on Saturday. And so I was kind of just filling in for him at practice. And I didn't know if I was going to start or not. I think 24 to 48 hours before the game, he's like, hey, Alex is a no go. You're starting. I was like, oh, okay, here we go. All right. So you're starting in Tampa Bay against Tom Brady. I just, I mean, just the kind of, just thinking about it, sort of like, wow, that's, that's really quite something. So you completed 24, sorry, 26 of 44 passes, 306 yards, threw a touchdown and an interception, and you rushed for an amazing touchdown. Talk, talk in that play, Taylor, I've watched it now a number of times and getting ready for this. And I, and I saw it live, um, but you're, you're, you're on the 10 yard line, you drop back, you're scrambling. You got a lot of pressure on both sides. You escape out of the pocket, you're running. And then it's like, I'm going for this. Talk us through like, okay, do I slide? Do I go out of bounds or do I really extend myself out there to go for that piling? Because that dive had a lot to do with what happened last year. So I want to get to that, but talk about what's going through your mind as you're going around the 12 yard line saying, am I going for that end zone or am I just going to go out of bounds? Yeah, so, you know, scrambling to my left, and I'm kind of still looking downfield to see if I can get a guy open. And I kind of glance at the pylon, and I glance at the guys downfield. They have their back to me. They're still trying to cover the receivers. So I'm like, okay, I'm going for this thing. And I just remember getting to about the five, four or five-yard line, and I just just took off and, and dove for it. And, um, you know, it was probably my best play of my life. Um, kind of separated my AC joint on that play too, but it was, it's all worth it. And I go, I kind of go back and think about, you know, if I was, it's the playoffs, it's against Tom Brady. Again, I might never play again. You know, I've had this moment kind of come up throughout my career that I don't know if I'm ever going to play again. So I'm just going to go for it and leave it all out there. And um, so that, I think that's one of the main reasons I dove for that pylon. If it was a regular season game and it's my six, seven start, I'd probably just run out of bounds at the two and give us, four plays to try to get in the end zone. But in that moment, I was, I was going for that pylon. And did they, did they have to push your shoulder back into the joint and it separated out to the point where it had to be popped back in? Or was it just a, 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 I mean, when I say a mild separation, you separated your AC joint. So I'm not trying to belittle it, but did they have to push it back in at the time or was it okay? No, it was, it was okay. I felt it pop. Uh, I got up, kind of wiggled it around. I felt the pain come through. Um, and then I had to go inside and they kind of, I think they shot me up with some like Novocaine or something there so I could get back in the game. So um, yeah, it was pretty painful there for a little bit. So um, two months later, Redskins come to you with a contract. 
And uh, it's got, uh, I believe it was a two-year contract, four million bucks, but no guarantees whatsoever on anything. So if you know they wanted to cut you or whatever else, that was just kind of that was it. So what what did you and Chris say in response to the Redskins and, and talk us through what ended up coming out of it? Because I find it to be fascinating. Yeah. So that's that was their initial offer was two years, four million, um, nothing guaranteed. And I told Chris, listen, man. Um, I, I want something guaranteed. Like I've, I put a lot of hard work throughout my career to, to try and get something that I feel a little bit comfortable with. Um, so they came back, you know, we kind of negotiated to not as much base salary. Um, it, I think it was a two year um, making, making minimum. I think it was one and 1.5, um, but you have incentives to where if you play, and you win, you're going to get some, some big bonuses. And I wanted to take that, that, that chance. And they also gave me a, a million dollar signing bonus. So, you know, signing that paper, you get a million dollars. I was like, okay, that, I can live with that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to bet on myself. So sure enough, um, I didn't think I was going to play at all last year. Fitzpatrick was a starter. And of course he goes down in the, I think first or second quarter of the first game. Hey. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Like, it's, it's time to go win some games. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, it's time to go earn some money. You know, this is your, this is your chance. And, um, you know, we have, the, we have the pleasure of – we won, I think, seven games last year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, there, was, there was a good amount of bonuses in that. Do you think, Taylor, that that incentive contract had an impact on how you played? I mean, the, the – the, 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 like kind of going back to Tampa Bay and you saying, you know, look, that might have been my moment. I'm going to go for it here because this might be it. And instead of running out of bounds at the two yard line, you dove and you made the touchdown and huge play for you, huge play for the Washington football team, et cetera. Do you think that that incentive based contract had a lot to do with your performance last year? Um, yeah, um, I'm not going to say that if, if it wasn't incentive based and I was making a little bit bigger, I would have played any differently. Um, but I will say every week there's something to play for. Um, you know, even if you're out of the playoffs, it's like, OK, you know, I, I there's something to play for out there. Kind of, you know, pad your bank account. You're trying to try and you're trying to make as much money as you can. And, you know, when, when you're out of the playoff race, which we weren't last year, but when you're out of it, there's still stuff to play for. And I think that's really cool. Um, that's kind of you go back to the XFL. You know, there was a lot of things like that where it was incentive based, where if uh, if you win, you get like a four thousand dollar bonus. And if you're on the roster, you get another two thousand dollar bonus. So there was incentives to try and win. Um, so it's kind of the same 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 deal. But I think a lot of people, a lot of players like it because, you know, there's something to play for. There's something you want to go out there and succeed. I watched in some of the clips from last season, I watched you thread the needle twice in the red zone against the Panthers to Sims and McLaurin. Um, and both of those were bullets. And I mean, just threading the needle straight through to them. First of all, how fast can you throw the ball? How far can you throw the ball? And does the, does, does the speed at which you're throwing that ball vary dramatically when you're in the red zone versus in any other part of the field? really can't throw the ball that hard and I really can't throw it that fast. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Says the NFL quarterback. I love it. I love it. No. Says the NFL quarterback. But, uh, you know, I've been working on my mechanics this off season to really try and work on that. Uh, I need to get my arm strength up a little bit. I think it'll help me a lot in my game. Um, but those two passes were probably the hardest I, I threw all last year. And, um, and the red zone, you have to you have to thread the needle, man. There's not as much room, and there's still 11 guys back there covering a small amount of field. So you have to thread the needle and be on time and make the right reads, you know, very quickly. So um, that was probably one of my best games. I remember, you know, it was Coach Rivera's homecoming to to, to Carolina, and it was Cam Newton's homecoming because he just came back, and it was his first time coming back to Charlotte. And um, you know. Cam used to play for Rivera. So it, there was a lot of things going on there. And it was a, it was a big game for both teams. And fortunately, we came out on top. So when you talk about the reads, there was against the Giants last season. Um, you're on the 20-yard line. You got a lot of pressure on you. You look left. And then seemingly from the television perspective, you just turn right and you throw this amazing pass to the corner of the end zone, um, which is caught by Ricky Seals-Jones. Um, did you actually look or do you just know he's going to be there 
from a read standpoint? Because when I watched you look left, it's almost in one motion where you look left and then you just throw it to the right-hand corner of the end zone. Are you just placing it there or do you actually have time to move, see, and go? Well, in that play specifically, that was more of a, hey, I'm going to give my guy a chance or it's going to be incomplete. Um, Because I remember it's, it's kind of like a four vertical play. It was too high and I wanted to hit Logan Thomas on the right side on the bender. And right when I was about to throw it, he, uh, he got covered and it didn't look good. So I kind of like was looking for my back or somewhere to go with the ball. And I just remember looking back right and seeing Ricky Seals on a corner and he's got about six inches on him and he's in the back of the end zone. So I was like, Hey, I'm gonna throw it high, you know, give this guy a chance to catch it. And if it's not going to be caught by him, it's going to be incomplete. So uh, Ricky made a great play and you know, that, that crowd went crazy. <laughs> It did. It was an amazing play. It's really fun to watch. So talk about play calling. And you talked about the difference as you move from high school to college and college to pro. Um, I've heard you talk about the way you call plays and how sophisticated it all is. And you talked about one time when you were playing for North Turner and he wanted you to have three different plays as you walked up to the line and you had to audible off of it. Just I I found it to be fascinating because all of us you know, we watch Peyton Manning on some television commercial and he's he's talking about Omaha, Omaha. And I've listened to you talk through the details of what you're both calling on and calling off as you step up to the line of scrimmage. Can you just walk us through the complexity of all that? Yeah, so I'll give you a, a play call that Norv would give me my rookie year. And mind you, again, I've, I've only been there for maybe a week and he expects me to know all this. So they called it the trifecta. So you go up there with, with three plays. So for instance, I remember it would be like twins, right? 50 ride kill 60 straight alert scat, right? Seems six thirty eight F wheel H set. I'm like, okay. So that's what you say in the huddle and the huddle like and everyone the- in the huddle is supposed to know exactly what all that means. Yes. Well, yes, they need to know the plays, but I need to know why to kill it or why to alert it. So you go up to the, the line they have that the weak side safety come down. I have to kill it. So kill it the 60 straight. Well, if it's a seven man box, I have to alert it because we can't block with those guys in the box. I have to alert the scat, right? Seems 638 F wheel. And so the guys at the line and the, the receivers and the running back, they don't really need to know why I need to kill it or alert it. They just need to know if I say kill it's 60 straight, if I say alert, it's scat, right? If I don't say anything, it's still 50 ride. So there's a lot of stuff going through your mind. And again, mind you, as a rookie quarterback coming in, um, in college, my my play call was two army mesh. And now it's that. Um, it was tough. So I had to, I had to get North to tell the, give me the play call in my helmet maybe six or seven times that, that day. So talk about talk about the helmets. Um, how good is that audio? And does the NFL listen to that audio to make sure that the coaches who are talking to you aren't telling you anything you're not supposed to know? So, yeah, the audio is really, really good. Uh, Sometimes it scratches in and out a little bit, but there's a rule in the NFL where they can only talk to you until there's 15 seconds left on the play clock. Once 15 seconds left on the play clock is, once it gets to 15 seconds, it cuts out. So if he's in the middle of calling a play and it cuts out, you got to make up a play. You got to, yeah, think of something. So um, that's, that's the NFL's way of keeping coaches out of your ear, you know, during a play or maybe like right before a play. So in a, in a hurry up offense, you're fine because the play clock started, started over. So you can get that play really quickly. But if for whatever reason, there's some delay in getting back into the huddle and you're running towards the end of it, you could actually get cut off. Yes. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's really mm-hmm. interesting. So you and I talked about this when we were together a couple of weeks ago. Um, how hard is it to keep momentum and focus when we do TV timeouts? I, I watch that and I would think that it's quite distracting and kind of disconcerting is you've got momentum going and you've, and you're, and you're exerting yourself physically. And then all of a sudden it's like, Hey, take two minutes and just chill out. Is that as difficult as it would seem, or is it not? It is. And there's some times where you like it and there's some times where you don't. So for instance, last year we're, uh, we're moving the ball pretty well. We're, we're doing hurry up. We're trying to keep all those guys on the defense on the field, no substitutions because they're getting tired. Um, and maybe someone goes down with an injury or something and it's a TV timeout, like, we had them, you know, we were moving the ball on them. They were tired and, you know, that's, that's when it stinks. But then there's some times where, you know, we're really grinding it out. It's a, it's a long drive. Um, you know, kind of guys are getting like our offensive lines getting tired or, you know, we need some receivers to get back in the game. Um, 
And again, so maybe someone on the defense goes down or maybe someone on the offense goes down and goes to a TV timeout. Like, okay, we can, we can regroup here. We can get, you know, fully loaded at receiver. Uh, maybe a guy that got a cramp to come back in, you know, something like that. But for the most part, we like to go hurry up to kind of keep that defense getting tired. And, um, you know, when they kind of go down with the cramp, it, it, it kills us because we have the momentum going and, you know, we had them on their heels. When you're in that huddle, if you will, all eyes are on you. And you've been in that huddle as someone who's been put in as a backup and then as a starter and then as the full starter for the season. As a leader, how much more authority did you feel you had last year in the huddle running the Washington football team than you did in some of your previous ones? Or always, because you're the quarterback and you're running the offense, you've always got that leadership view. Yeah, you got to have that leadership. At the same time, you have to have that aura around you that you're in charge. Um, you don't want a guy coming in there kind of stumbling his words or um, not looking you in the eye or not confident in what he's saying. Um, so I always try to make a point when I'm in the huddle is to look at every single player. So when I'm calling the formation, I'll look at everybody. When I start calling the, you know, the, the protection, I'll look at the offensive line. Um, when I start calling like the route concepts, I'll start pointing like which side has this concept or, you know, stuff like that and look at the receivers. So I think that just gives them a lot of confidence that I know what I'm doing. Um, kind of helps them out, you know, where they need to line up and, and you know, what routes they have. Um, I think you know, that goes a long way, you know, looking those guys in the eyes in the huddle and having that confidence in your, in your voice um, gives them the confidence that, hey, this is going to be a successful play. So, you know, I've been working on that my whole career. But again, you know, in college, we were hurry up. We didn't we didn't huddle. Um, so it was it was a work in progress. In pregame. I've seen you in pregame and you've got kind of the pre pregame and then you got the pregame before you actually go play the game. Um, is there any difference in your playlist between the pre pregame and the pregame? Oh yeah. The pre pregame. Yeah. The pre pregame when, uh, when you go out before you warm up with the team, kind of going out there, warm up by yourself. I'm uh, trying to get like super pumped. You know, we're about to play for Sunday afternoon. We're about to play a game. You know, you kind of look back and like I'm in the NFL, we're playing football. Let's go. You know, this is this is really cool. And then um, the pregame, kind of the same deal, but I'm getting a little bit more relaxed, a little more composed. And then right before I come out for the game, I, I start, just, I, th I throw on some classical music, no words, just very soothing music, trying to get in that Zen mode where I can very con like concentrate and not get too pumped up. So as a quarterback, you don't want to get too emotional, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's it's a vast difference in about the hours from pre pregame to right before game time. Is there any significance to the number four? Or is it just a number that you've had and like? Um, there is significance to it. You know, the whole reason I started playing football was because of Brett Favre. Um, when I was born, my dad was my dad was born in Wisconsin. He's he was a cheesehead, and when I was born, I was forced to be a, a Green Bay Packer fan. So I was forced to watch Brett Favre and. I don't think I would have fell in love with football if it wasn't for him. You know, he had a lot of passion and fun for the game. Um, every Sunday I was pumped to watch him play because it was, it was fun. It was fun to watch him. And um, so throughout college, I had 14. I think someone else had number four. And um, and then I get to to, um, to Washington and I show up and I'm number four. I'm like, oh, this is great. Um, this is this is really cool. And it's worked out ever since. Let's talk about conditioning for a moment. Um you do a lot of time in the, in the gym, um, mostly weights or wa a combination of weights and cardio combination about 50, 50. Um, and as it relates to your strength training, a combination of upper body and lower body or predominantly upper body, uh, actually predominantly lower body. Um, I want to keep a lot of my weight there. Um, and again, throughout the years I've, I've, I've kind of varied from, from what I do in the upper body. But, you know, throughout the years, the, the biggest question mark for me was durability. And again, with my AC joint separations, I have to be pretty tight up there and, and, and keep that healthy. So I've been I've used to do really heavy stuff up top um, but that kind of hindered my throwing motion and stuff like that. So throughout the years of trying to you know experiment with different types of deals. Uh, so I, I still do a little bit of heavy weight up top just to keep stabilized. But I do a lot more band work now, too, to kind of take the stress off my shoulder and, and my arm. So it's, a, there's a very fine line of, of what I'm doing upper body, but lower body. I try, I, I try and go heavy. I I've seen um, some videos of you training and there was a, 
hit that you took playing against the Carolina Panthers where you just, your whole body gets contorted. You've got someone around your legs and then someone hits your upper body. And I, literally it looks like your lower body is going to have enough strain that you might have, heaven forbid, the type of accent that Alex Smith had where his, where his uh, um, fibia and tibia both snapped. Um, how do you train to be that flexible? You know, it's, it's pretty bizarre because the guy I work out with, we don't, we don't teach flexibility. We don't practice that. Um, what he does is he tries to strengthen up everything around your joints and he, he pretty much tries to have you like very strong around the joints and don't go past 90 degrees, very simple stuff with heavy weight. So when you do get in those, you know, positions, you're strong enough in around those joints. So it doesn't pop or anything like that. And I know it sounds very kind of, you know, he gets a lot of flack for it, but it, it's been working for me. And ever since I've been out working out with him, I've, I've stayed not injured. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bizarre deal. A lot of people like to go, you know, all the way down when they're squatting. Um, I think that hurts your back and I think that hurts your joints and your hips, your knees, stuff like that. So we don't, we barely get to 90 degrees and we go back up. And I think that helps, you know, take the stress off the joints and really strengthen the muscles around it. So when you get in those positions, uh, you're strong enough to withstand it. Hmm. Super interesting and, and counterintuitive to what I thought you were going to say as it relates to sort of strengthening and flexibility and creating more flexibility rather than, if you will, erring on the strength side, having that flexibility. So that's, that's super interesting. When I was, when I saw that hit, I went and looked back at Alex Smith's hit and what I was surprised with, which um, was the, I remember vividly when Lawrence Taylor took down Joe Theismann um, back in the 1980s. And what shocked me was the similarities between the Alex Smith injury and the Joe Theismann injury. There was like this graph I looked at that compared the two and they were like identical injuries on same day of the year and on the same yard line. Yep. Same yard line. Um, the guy that tackled him was a three-time pro bowler at the time or something like that, or a three-time defensive player of the year at the time. Um, it, it, it was very eerie. I think there was like six or seven exact same deals, same yard line. Again, I think they were wearing maybe the same number or it, it, it was bizarre. Same date. Yeah. And they were yeah. both, I guess, missing their all pro defensive, uh, uh, defensive end. As well. Like, so both had their, their left tackles out. Exactly. It was just like, I was just sitting there doing this and I was like, wow, I, that's just eerie. I mean, and it was on the, I think it was the 39 yard line. I mean, it's on the exact same yard line. It was just super weird. I want to say it was, I think it was 32 years apart or something like that. So, you know, and same final score, the final score was 23, 21 in both games. I mean, super weird, by the way, you knew, you know, Alex very well. Um, Talk about seeing his injury and what that looked like and watching his rehab. Yeah. So I wasn't there when it, when it happened to him. Um, When I showed up to Washington, he was rehabbing. And I think he was in his second year there. Um, rehabbing maybe. Um, but I just remember I didn't get to, I didn't see his leg or scar. He always had a sleeve over it or a brace on it or something. And I remember going in the in the training room one day and he had it off and they were doing some treatment on it. I would go over and look at it and it looks like a, a dang shark bite, like from right over his knee to down through his foot. It's an indention shark bite looking thing and i just remember saying like why are you still playing football man like it's a blessing that you can still walk um that's who he is he's an amazing person he wanted to prove people wrong and he wanted to keep playing ball so you know the guy's a special guy he's probably one of the most special human beings i've ever met so um no i can't say enough good things about him a lot lot, a lot of similarities between you and alex smith my friend um a lot of similarities um so you're in the nfl quarterback in the NFL, but no bling. You drive a, you drive a Ford pickup truck. Um, you going to swap that out for a Tesla pickup, pickup truck when you get your hands on one? <laughs> I would love to, man. I think those cyber trucks are super cool looking. Um, I don't know when they're coming out. Hopefully Elon fixed that whole, uh, that whole deal where he hit the, hit the car with the truck and the, or with the bat and the window busted open, kind of rained all over his parade that day. But um, no, I'd definitely love to get one of those. Those are super cool. Um, Washington football team to commanders, um, not the red tails. Um, 
talk for a moment about the the naming of the team you're playing for right now. I as as a as someone who grew up as a Redskins fan, which the name is obviously now retired. I had finally gotten used to the Washington football team. And then all of a sudden they come out with the commanders. And I, I can't tell you that I, as I talked about bringing you on, I would say to people, he, he plays for the Commodores or for the, 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 the comrades or something else. I sort of thought I was going to play like the, the Soviet union theme song on, <laughs> on, the, on the comrades for this, but how did, I mean, I'm assuming some marketing team for the, for the Washington football team came up with that thing and then launched it on you all. And you didn't have any input on that one. I didn't. I know. I think they asked two or three guys on the team. I think it was like Terry, Chase Young, Josh, uh, John Allen. Um, I think they asked those guys for a little input at the beginning of the year last year. But, you know, I've, I've, I've spoken out about this, you know, a couple of times. Um, I have no problem with the name. I think it could have been a little better. I think they could have gone somewhere else. But I think it's a safe option. You know, with a lot of things going on here right now. There's that's a safe option to do. But I will say the the uniforms look sweet. The helmets look awesome. And uh, I'm excited for guys to see those out in the field. It's going to be a, a really clean look. So let's talk a little bit about this upcoming season. Um, the commanders just signed Carson Wentz. Big contract. Um, I heard you asked uh, any chance that you're going to be the starter. And you said no, no chance that plays with your personality, Taylor. I can't also, I can also tell you that there are a lot of people out there who are saying you are going to be a starter at some point. Obviously you've played this role before you've played backup, you've supported, you've been a great supporter of the starting quarterbacks and you've gotten your, your, your shots. Um, after having had a, a successful season last year, how do you feel about them bringing in Carson and, you know, giving him the, the, the starting slot? Well, I kind of knew it was going to happen after the season. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about going out and getting someone or, or drafting somebody. Um, and so I, I kind of knew it was going to happen. I just didn't know who. And, you know, they, they went out and get Carson. And, you know, I've been with him in OTAs and, and stuff like that. And he's he's really impressive. The guy can make some throws and, and do some things that, you know, I can't do. Um, and, you, again, I, I'm sure you're referring to that that question that you saw on the, on the Internet. And, you know, a lot. What I want to say about that is it's not that's not me bowing down to to somebody or kind of, you know, it's it, at the end of the day, it's just a business. I'm not I'm not preparing any differently if I was starting or being backing up. Um, I'm preparing the same. I'm going out there and I'm trying to get him better. I'm, I'm competing with him. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm a realist and I, and I understand the business. And, um, you know, I want to I want to go out there and, and, and perform well in practice and, and during camp and try and get him better. Um, but I also know that, you know, I'm, I'm there to back him up and, and, and be there in any case that if he gets, if he gets hurt or something happens that I can go in there and be successful. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm still training, I'm still preparing, like I'm starter. Um, but again, you know, I just, I'm a realist and I, I see kind of the, the writing on the wall. Um, that being said, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for Carson. I hope he succeeds. Um, he, we got a lot of weapons around him. We have a really good offensive line in front of him. Um, our defense is going to do great things this year. So I'm excited. I'm excited for the year. Um, I think there's, it's, we're going to surprise a lot of people. The um, commanders also just signed Terry McLaurin to a three year, $71 million contract. How good is he? He's worth all that. And maybe a little bit more. Um, you know, I, I'm excited that he's back. You know, we missed him during OTAs and mini camp, but um, all that matters is that he's going to be there during the year. So, you know, I know we're all happy to have him back and he's, he's good for the locker room as well. So, you know, that was, a, that was a huge get for us. What's the differentiator on a, a receiver like Terry in the sense of, is it that he runs perfect patterns that he's just faster or his catching and leaping ability? Is there one, is there one characteristic of him that makes him so special? Or is it kind of a combination of all that? I think it's a combination of all that. Uh, the dude can fly, obviously. Um, he makes some bizarre some bizarre catches as you saw last year. Um, and you know, there's, there's a lot of plays where you're like, no one, no one can make that plan. Terry just, Terry just makes it. And you know, probably just as much as I do, you know, receivers and DBs are like the divas of the team. You know, they're the kind of the pretty boys, this, this, and that. And Terry's not that. Um, you'll never hear Terry complain anything. He's probably the, probably the greatest guy on the team. And when you have that as a captain and as your best receiver, it trickles down. And, you know, as much as he does on the field, he does that much off the field as well. So he's a huge gift for us. He's a huge captain for us. He's, he's a, again, I can't say enough good things about Terry. Um, Coach Ron Rivera 
Um, you've liked playing for him. Who's the best coach you've ever had? Um, I'll say coach Ron. Um, he's, he's a player's coach, but he also keeps you accountable. Like he, he, you're, if you're at work, you're there to work, but he's also gonna let you be yourself and have fun and, and, you know, kind of just have fun with it. He knows football is supposed to be fun, but at the same time, we want to go out there and win. Like we're there to win. So it's, it's, it's really cool. He, he lets guys kind of talk talk dirty to each other during practice, you know, it's, it, it's, it's cool. So, um, you know, a lot of guys love playing for him. Again, he's a player's coach. He looks out for us, but again, when we're there. It's, it's, it's time to work. And when you're not working, you're playing golf. Um, you you were a baseball player, um, NFL football player. How's your, how's your, uh, how's your golf game? Uh, I'm happy that I came on now than maybe a week ago because I had the best round of my life uh, about four or five days ago. I shot a 79 first time ever breaking 80. And um, it was, it was pretty bizarre. I, I parred every hole on the back nine, 17 comes around. I top my drive into a fairway bunker. I'm like, Oh, I, I just screwed it up. And I uh, actually got up and down for bogey. And then I parked the last hole to, to make a 79. So it was, it was a huge day for me. I was pumped. And uh, I'm actually playing today, so hopefully, um, hopefully I can do the same. So final question I have for you, Taylor. Um, you talked about your parents and sort of learning tenacity from them. Um, and it seems like that's been, as I look on your career and how successful you've been at sticking with it, it's just, it's admirable that, you know, people have sort of said, you can't do that and you've done it. And people have said, it's time to hang up the cleats and you've stayed in the game and then gotten your opportunity to, to, to succeed and perform. Um, it's, does that all come from early childhood and being taken to the field with your dad and just saying, stay in that game? Or is there anything else that was a formative experience that makes it so that when kind of the chips are down, you kind of look back to something, whether it's faith, whether it's some other experience in your life that keeps you moving forward. I think a lot of it has to do with my parents, um, but a lot of it had to do with, I mean, when I was a young kid, man, I just had so many dreams of being in the NFL or being in the MLB. Like I wanted to to do that. Like that was my dream. And, you know, I'm not going to let, I, I heard people say you can't do it from a young age. Like you're, you're not a running back. You're not a quarterback. You, you can't do that. Like this is your position. And I just keep working hard at it. I'm like, I'm not going to let this guy tell me what I can and can't do. Um and, you know, it's, it's proven throughout the years to work for me. And so when I keep hearing it, I'm just, you know what? I've heard this before, man. I've heard it for the last 20 years. Like, I'm going to prove you wrong. And I think that was – that might be the biggest one of it. I just had that dream where I was going to make it and no one was going to stop me. And I think a lot of it has to do with my parents as well. So between those two things, that's kind of driven me throughout the years. And here we are. Hopefully I got a couple more in me. Well, um, as someone who both wants to see you do really well, um, I also want to see the commanders do well. So I can't root against Carson. But at the same time, maybe I don't know, maybe some maybe maybe Carson gets COVID. Let's do that, because that's not that's not a, like that's not him getting injured. Maybe Carson gets COVID. He steps out. You step in. And the next thing you're the starter. That's maybe that's a good hope for me for the season to have you behind the behind uh, behind center. But Taylor, it's, it's been a real pleasure. I'm greatly appreciate you taking the time. I'm looking forward to the two of us getting out on the golf course together. Um, enjoy this period of time between now and when you go back for preseason camp and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Billy, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate you. Thanks, Taylor. Take care. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Have a great week.